church, let's stand. Let's lift up the name of the Lord together. I saw Satan fall like lightning. I saw darkness run for cover. But the miracle that I just can't get over. signs and wonders I have resurrection power still the miracle that I just can't get over my name is registered in heaven oh my praise belongs to you forever this is my testimony from death to life Cause Grace rewrote my story I'll testify By Jesus Christ the righteous I'm justified This is my testimony This is my testimony Come together sons and daughters in water Sing the praises of the Spirit, Son and Father Our God will finish what He started Who oh, is our God will finish what He started This is my testimony from death to life Because grace rewrote my story I'll testify by Jesus Christ the How are you guys doing this morning? Good? Fantastic. I always love being up here because we have a little monitor, a TV up here that has the, uh, the sound as it's going out on television. And uh, we're also getting the live sound right here. So uh, now this is going to get lost on many of you, but if you're my age or older, you, you'll understand this. It's like those old Chinese movies. You remember? The voice, the mouth doesn't match up with the words and all that kind of stuff. So we've we just been having, that's what we do. Spiritual things is what we do while we're up here. Uh, 
But anyway, today we have three that are following through in believer's baptism. Uh, We had one in the first service uh, that followed through in believer's baptism. I always want to make it very clear. There there is nothing magical or mystical or anything about this water. Uh, It is kind of warm this morning. feels kind of good. But it's just regular old tap water. But what this represents is beautiful. Because this is the first act of obedience for a follower of Jesus Christ. But it is a profession. That Jesus Christ, when I put my faith and trust in him, forgave me of all my sin. So here's what that means. It means that they never again have to sit there and worry, oh my goodness, is my sin going to separate me from the relationship that I have with Jesus? Absolutely not. He forgave the effects of all sin. And so uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful picture, uh, but we don't come to Jesus through the act of baptism. It is through faith. And then we follow through in obedience through baptism. And so today, what a great example these three will be. And I would also encourage you uh, to, uh, to celebrate with them as they celebrate the fact that Jesus is Lord of their life. All right, Miss Lily. Perfect. Let me turn you around right here. So this is Miss Lily, one of our middle school students and. Uh, attends there at Merritt Brown. One of her friends invited her to come and be a part of our student ministry here. And uh, I believe the, uh, the last Wednesday night of Super September, she trusted Christ as her Lord and Savior. And so we're thankful for that. Lily, today it is my honor, it is my privilege to be able to baptize you, but it is also my responsibility to ask you who is the Lord of your life. Jesus Christ. Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. (laughs) All right, now we got a set of brothers. I'm going to bring them both in the water at the same time. The Kavoris boys. Jared, you come stand right here. Here we go. No one scoop forward just a little bit. So these are some brothers that I've gotten to know over the last year or so uh, through my son. Uh, Jared plays on the baseball team up at Mosley. And uh, what an unbelievable game the other night, man. You were grabbing everything out in left field. And any, Anyway, we're just talking baseball. This is Nolan. Nolan's not the baseball player. He's the soccer player. And uh, just through conversations and being able to talk with them, and they've been attending church here, uh, they both have shared how they came to know Christ. And, uh, and I told them, I said, I'm going to bring you both into the water because how often do you get to say, I stood in the bab- baptistry waters with my brother? And so a very, very exciting thing today. Now, Nolan, I don't know much about soccer, uh, but I do know this. You have shared with me that... Uh, Uh, Over the last year or so, you really started getting serious about your pursuit for Christ. And one day at FCA over at Arnold High School, you prayed to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. And you've been pressing into him over the last year. And you're like, it's amazing what he has done in my life. And uh, the great testimony is this. He's not through with you yet, right? And so today we get to celebrate with you. It is my honor and privilege to be able to baptize you. But it is also my responsibility to ask you the question, who is the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Amen. Based upon that public profession of faith, Nolan, in Jesus as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Congratulations. All right, this is his older brother, Jared. Jared, uh, just... Love the conversations that we've had, what God's doing in your life. And I know kind of the same thing. You just said, you know what, kind of, kind of grown up around the church and people in the church. Uh, but over the last year, uh, you're, you know, I think you even made the statement that not only has God uh, done an amazing work in my life, but he's, uh, he's kind of saved me and rescued me from maybe uh, someplace you didn't want to be. Um, but anyway, uh, We're thankful for what he has done in your life and thankful for this pursuit. And and again, believe the greatest days are ahead. 
And so it's my honor and privilege to be able to baptize you today. It is also my responsibility, though, to ask you, who is the Lord of your life? Jesus Christ. Amen. Jared, based upon that public profession of faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I can baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I'll tell you what, it's like I was grabbing hold of rocks. Man, those guys are stout. Uh, but anyway, uh, we're thankful that you're here today. If you're visiting with us today, we would love to be able to tell you about our church and talk to you about how you can follow Christ as your Lord and Savior, ways to get involved here at the church. Uh, we would, you know, it would help us out if you would fill out one of our guest registration cards. You can do that one of two ways. You can do it electronically. One of the very last slides that you'll see on the screen today is a way for you to take out your phone and text to the number on the screen. Uh, the word guest. You'll see a lot of other words on the screen as well, but if you'll text the word guest, that'll go uh, to our staff. We'll get in our system. They'll reach out to you, and they'll set up a time where they can have a conversation with you as our guest today. But if you don't want to do that, we have uh, guest registration cards that are all over this room in chair back pockets, and you can take one of those physical cards out, and you can fill it out. You can drop it in the offering bucket. We're going to pass it in just a moment. Uh, you can put it in one of the red drop boxes that are located around this campus. Here's what we would encourage you to do, though. If you've never come to our Welcome Center, it's located right out there in the main lobby area. Big word welcome above it. Come out there. Bring that card. Because then we can answer those questions face-to-face. We're going to give you some information about our church, pray with you, help you in any way we can. And we also have a little sweet treat that we would like to give you for being our guest today. Let me encourage you, Highland Parkers, if you brought somebody with you today, it is your responsibility to make sure you bring them by the Welcome Center before they leave. Man, it's already been a great, great day in our first service and uh, just God moving and God working. And I told you, one followed through in believer's baptism. And we believe that he is going to do the very same thing in this service as well. You know, yesterday, my, uh, my, uh, my oldest daughter, uh, she, uh, she got married. And, uh, you know, at first, I was a little, a little disappointed because she, um, she scheduled her marriage on the third Saturday of October, which means nothing to many of you. And those of you who know what I, I'm talking about, it means a lot to you. Um, but you know what? You know what I've come to find out? What a great gift that she gave to her daddy. Uh, I didn't have to watch that football game yesterday. <laughs> And so, man, what a great gift. I'm thankful for that. And uh, anyway, so for those of you that are waiting on me to rub it in and make fun of me, how dare you do that on my daughter's wedding day? Uh, <laughs> I would not do that to you for anything. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'll be, I'll be out at the Welcome Center afterwards. You come. I usually make that invitation. The only folks that come out there and give me a hard time are sweet little old ladies and little girls. They just come and really rub it in. But uh, anyway, hey, I want to ask our ushers to go ahead and come forward today. We continue to worship by giving our tithe and our offering. Would you agree today that you have been blessed beyond what you deserve? Yeah, Absolutely. Every single one of us in this place, God has given resources, uh, not because of who we are, but in spite of who we are and because of who he is. But the neat thing about that is the reason why he's given us those resources is to make much of him. And also not to put our faith and trust in money or resources, but our faith and trust in him. It's kind of a neat thing that this little old church right here in Bay County, how God uses this church all around the world to share the good news of Jesus Christ, to, uh, to help folks with changed lives, and really just to show them the love that comes from God. And so because of your faithful giving, we're able to do that. Let me encourage you to continue to do that. But also, let me encourage you to do that today for the simple fact, he's worthy. He is worthy. And so if you come in this room and you're like, I'm going to sing this song and I'm going to give him all I got, and yet you hold back your tithe or your offering, you're not giving him all you got. You're putting your faith and trust in something else. And so today, there's a way that you can give. They'll come. They'll bring this offering bucket. You can put cash or you can put check in there. Or you can give electronically, text to give. You'll see it on the screens. It's convenient. It's safe. Uh, let us just be faithful to give. Yesterday, we had uh, a group of 15 that came back from Honduras spending time there over the last week. 
uh, on a dental mission trip. And Corey, I know that you were a part of that team. And uh, it's because of your faithful giving church that we're able to continue to go all the way across the world and tell folks the most important thing that they could ever hear. Jesus will forgive you as well. As our ushers make their way, let me pray. Lord Jesus, thank you so much for what we've already seen. Thank you for this young lady. Thank you for these brothers. Thank you for their families and friends that are here to celebrate with them today. And Father, we praise you for what they have professed. Jesus is my Lord. And God, I pray that you would do amazing things through their lives, that you would continue to draw them close to you, and that their pursuit and the love that they have for you, it would just increase within their lives. Make them into you, Jesus. We also thank you that you've blessed our church. Thank you that we can give to you this offering. Our prayer is that you would take it and that you would use it to do things that are much greater than any we could ever imagine. Lord Jesus, we give this today not out of compulsion. We give this to you today not out of bitterness or resentment. We are blessed to be able to give to you. Thank you, God. Thank you. And our prayer is that you would be with this service. Guide us in all that we say, all that we do. Be with all the many other activities that are happening right now around this campus and churches and campuses that we've planted all around this world. Our prayer is that the name of Jesus would be the name that is quick on everyone's lips. We love you, Jesus. We thank you for loving us because we know that there are times that we're just not very lovely. But thank you that your love still is sufficient. Lord, we pray that you would be blessed through all. In the name of Jesus, amen. You are awesome in this place, mighty God. You are awesome in this place,
Well, yeah, don't, don't be in a hurry. Because, okay, so, so, so listen, I, I think context is key here. Um, in, in, the, in the Old Testament and the temple and, and the sacrifice system and the worship, you know, there, there, was, there was one job that belonged to one particular priest, and that was to make sure the incense never run out. The Bible says that it was a sweet aroma to God's nose or his nostrils, okay? That it was an act of worship. Now, now hear me, guys. Now, what is a sweet fragrance to his nose is our lives. And so we don't, we don't have anybody here on our ministerial staff in the back you know, Andrew's not back there making sure the incense is full and, you know, and doing all that. Now, that's happening here in this room. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Here's what it means. He's worthy of our praise all the time. All the time. Not just Sunday, not just Wednesday, not just good days, bad days. And here's why that's so important. Because... Good days or bad days, it doesn't change his character. That if there's anyone that you can always count on being the same, it's him. And so uh, Patrick, the guy, Patrick helps me out a lot. And we were upstairs and he was like, I really need you to hurry up because I want to be in there when they sing that song again. (laughs) And so uh, naturally we lost a mic clip, all kinds of stuff happened. And, uh, and we're coming down, I said, all right, I'll make them sing it some more. Because uh, Patrick's a big old boy. You don't want him upset, all right? But no, that's not why we're going to sing it. And, and hmm. You may be tempted to sit there today and say, well, why don't we keep singing that over it? They kept filling up that incense. They kept filling up that incense. They kept, is it out? Don't let it run out. Because he's still worthy. Keep bringing it to his, to his nostrils. You are worthy of it all. Pick a good spot and just do it again. Praise his name today. Come on. Night and 
Let's pray. Oh God, you deserve it all. Lord, all of our praise, all of our time, all of our money, all of our lives, because you are worthy. So God, we stand here today giving you all the praise and all the glory because you are the one who saved us. God, we love you and we praise you. And it is in the holy and precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. You can be seated. Amen. I always love looking around the room because there's some of you are like, I thought I walked into a Baptist church. <laughs> nah, we were just teasing. You really didn't. If you have your Bibles this morning, open up to John chapter 7. We've been walking verse by verse through the book of John. And so we've still got a long ways to go. But today we're going to be looking at verses 37, 38, and 39 in John chapter 7. Now, let me give you a little bit of setting to what is taking place in this text in case maybe you've not been here over the last couple of weeks or you're new to us. The Feast of Tabernacles is what is happening in John chapter 7. And so the Feast of Tabernacles is one of the three major feasts or festivals among the, uh, the Israelites. And uh, this one would have been almost like our Thanksgiving. Uh, they were celebrating what God, what he did for the nation of Israel as he delivered them from Egyptian bondage or slavery. How God's provision and protection was there. They would celebrate by moving out of what would be their normal house. And they would build kind of this little lean-to structure, this little tent made out of tree limbs and leaves and, you know, all kinds of things. Uh, and, and they would kind of camp out for the week. But it was a great, great time of celebration. One of the things that they would do is they would thank God for the water. Because they thought, well, you know what? Life comes from water. I think you would agree with that, that life is a very, or water is a very valuable commodity when it comes to life. For those of you that were here five years ago, and we walked through that Category 5 hurricane, uh, we understand just how valuable water can be, or at least we thought so. Do you remember how it happened that, uh, and it was my first hurricane to walk through. I mean, we don't have hurricanes up in Tennessee and Arkansas. And so uh, folks started reaching out, uh, not only to me as an individual, but they started reaching out on behalf of our church because they knew that our church would be an integral part of the recovery process. And so they're like, hey, listen, we want to send you something. We want to help you. What can we send? And I'm like, Water. We've got to have water. And so one guy's like, I'll send you a whole 18-wheeler full of water. And I'm like, yes. And he sent two. And then he called someone that I didn't even speak to. And he's like, hey, we got to get them water. Send them water. I mean, right? Some of you guys, the night before, you were prepping. You were filling all of your bathtubs full of water. And so then FEMA got involved. And they filled a whole parking lot full of water. To the point that we're like a week in, and I'm like, somebody's got to come get all this water. We had enough water out there to fill the Gulf of Mexico. Come on, please get the water. Please get the water. And so now whenever uh, we may be facing a possible hurricane or I'm talking to someone that's walking through where we were walking through five years ago, and they're like, well, you know, how, how should I prep? How should I get ready? I'm like, number one, don't worry about water. I mean, you want batteries and you want that liquid gold called gasoline. And uh, about four days in, you know, we had this area set up uh, over here in the parking lot with a big circus tent over there that we were handing out supplies to folks, you know, basic necessities. And they, had, they were bringing in those uh, 18-wheelers full of supplies in order for us to, to meet the needs of the community. And about four days in, one of our staff people came to me and said, hey, pastor, I really need to know what to do with this. I'm like, okay, what is it? Well, there's this woman who has just dropped off a four-pack of ice-cold Coca-Cola bottles. And I don't know what to do with it. I'm like, you give that to me, I'll take care of that. <laughs> and those Cokes entered the ministry. You know what I'm talking about, right? 
Uh, no, I didn't take them all. I, didn't, I shared with, a, you know, the staff that I love the most. I shared with them. Um, but uh, anyway, water, water. We, we admit that water gives life. So that's what they're doing. They're saying, oh, God, thank you for the water. If it weren't for the water, we couldn't even celebrate the harvest. We couldn't even celebrate the crops. Water, we need water, God. Thank you for the water. And then they would do something every day during these eight days of the celebration of this feast. The priest would take this big golden pitcher and he would do this solemn parade, which was, which was so weird because everything else was very celebratory, right? And they were very excited. And, and, and then everybody would get real quiet. They would meet down at the temple steps and he would lead them on this very quieted parade down to the pool of Siloam. They would take the golden pitcher. They would dip it down in the pool of Siloam. Then they would come back up to the temple steps and they would pour out the water as a sacrifice on the steps of the temple. And the people would go crazy. And they would start screaming and yelling, Hosanna, hallelujah, thank God for the water, thank God for the water. So that's what's happening in this scripture that we're going to read today. Christ has seen this happen many times. And Jesus is saying, oh, no, no, no. I'll talk to you about water. I'm the water. Friend, I'm telling you, based upon the authority of God's word today, if you find yourself thirsty in life, if you find yourself saying, you know what, man, I am so dry, I am so parched, oh, I wish I could get a drink, Jesus says, you can because the wells of heaven are open. Let's look at what he has to say. Y'all with me today? All right. Don't get excited about singing and not about the word. Look at what it says in verse 37. He says in 37, on the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried out saying, if anyone thirst, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. Notice what he says there. He he says... He who believes in me, as the Spirit has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. So he is saying here, guys, if you want that never-ending, right, That, 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 that complete refreshment and fulfillment, it is found in me, quenched forever in me. And then he promises them a life of spiritual fulfillment and joy through the Holy Spirit. Look in verse 39. In verse 39. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit of God whom those believing in him would receive, for the Holy Spirit was not yet given because Jesus was not yet glorified. So the Holy Spirit was not yet given. I've got good news, church. The Holy Spirit has come. I've got good news. He is alive and he is well today. I've got good news that Jesus has been glorified. The Spirit has come, and he says, I will fill you with life-giving water. And that is good news. Man, even if you don't act like it's good news, it's good news. So here's what I want us to do today. I want us to look at some of the greatest people of the Bible who found themselves walking through the journey of life needing a drink. Now, my gift to you today is we'll only talk about two. Two points, not three. Please do not misinterpret that to think that you're going to get out early. They wouldn't quit singing. Don't blame it on me. (laughs) Two times that I think we can all identify with this. In this Christian pilgrimage, we were talking about that with the young people of their day as we were baptizing them, that this is the first act of obedience, but now that leads to a lifestyle, right? A a lifetime of obedience, transforming, being, being made more and more into the image of Jesus. It is a journey. It is a pilgrimage. Two times that I think we need to get a drink. Well, I mean, some of you are saying this. You're saying, well, hang on just a second. I'm a Christian. I've had a drink. Here's what I found out. There are times that I need another drink. Now, I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying there are times that I need to get saved again. Salvation, that brings about that relationship between you and Jesus Christ. 
All right, that is held firmly, securely in him. I mean, he's been preaching and teaching about this as we walk through the book of John. So I'm not saying that you lose your salvation, that there are times that you need to get another drink of the salvation water. I'm just saying that even the saved, there are times walking through life, the dust gets a little thick in the throat. There, there are times that we get dehydrated. So the first the first time, when our celebration ceases, we need a drink. Exodus chapter 15, that's what I want us to look at. They're having a hallelujah meeting here. They're singing and shouting, it is the nation, the children of Israel. And I want you to look at the screens. This is Exodus 15 verses 1 and 2. It says, Then Moses and the children of Israel sang this song to the Lord and spoke, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him, my Father's God, and I will exalt him. They're singing, man. They're celebrating. Why are they singing? Because here's what's happened. After living all those years in Egyptian slavery, they've been set free. And they're moving along. Matter of fact, Pharaoh even said, get out of here and get out of here quick. And as they're being delivered from that bondage and they're moving, all of a sudden they come up on the Red Sea and they turn around and look and yonder comes Pharaoh and his armies. He said, I've changed my mind. I'm coming after you. And I'm not coming after you to welcome you back. I'm coming after you to kill you. And so the man of God, Moses, he takes his staff, right? And he he touches the water and the water, it rises up. It, It comes up and it creates a pathway right through the middle of the Red Sea. You believe that? I said, do you believe that? All right, if you believe it, say it. If you don't, don't say a word. And so they make their way through, and as they come to the other side, all of a sudden the man of God, he he touches the water again, and now that water that was standing up in heaps comes cascading down on Pharaoh and all of his army, and they all drown right there. I'm just saying that they were up against insurmountable odds. There was no hope. There was no help. And then all of a sudden, God did the miraculous. And do you know what happened when they got to the other side? Man, they had a worship service. Put what we have in here to shame. They were flat out. They were more Pentecostal than Pentecostals. Man, they were, they were spirited and they were loud and they were singing and they were dancing. And for 21 verses, they had a spell. And then look down to verse 22. So Moses brought Israel from the Red Sea. And then they went out into the wilderness of Shur. And they went three days in the wilderness and they found no water. And when they came to Marah, they could not drink the waters of Marah for they were bitter. Marah means bitter. Look, it says, therefore the name of it was called Marah. Makes sense. Bitter. Bitter. And the people complained against Moses, saying, what shall we drink? Now, here they are. Notice what has happened. For 21 verses, thank you, God, praise you, God, you know, you're worthy of it all. My goodness, I don't know what they were singing, but man, they were into it. Yes, praise you, Yahweh, thank you, God, you delivered us. Our hope is in you. And Moses is like, all right, we got to stop. We got to quit the worship service. We've got to move on. (laughs) And then they come tomorrow, and their singing stops. It's been disturbed. All the euphoria of worship has disappeared into weariness. And the first thing that happens when they get weary is they quit singing. Oh, man, there are so many parallels that you and I 
uh, have along with the children of Israel. We are on a journey, right, passing from one shore to another shore. The Bible even says this over in 1 Peter, that if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you are a pilgrim, you are a stranger, someone who's going home but is not home yet. And every time I read that, I'm like, thank you, Lord, this world ain't my home. And let's admit it sometimes, church. Sometimes we're traveling this journey, and even the best of us, it gets tiring. Sometimes as you and I are going on this pilgrimage for the Lord, sometimes it gets weary. And sometimes when we're doing what we ought to be doing, we get tired and we get thirsty. And the first thing that we stop doing is celebrating. I didn't say we were immoral. I didn't say that. I didn't say that we're running headlong into sin. I didn't even make that comment. But the very first thing that happens when we get a little dehydrated spiritually, a little dry is we quit singing. We quit celebrating. Do you have any idea how many churches have gathered together today with good Christian folks just doing their duty and they've gathered together today and there's no celebration at all? And they've long since quit singing. Why? Because the journey has grown weary. And you know what's occurred to me? Some of God's most faithful are the most miserable. Oh, I got to teach that class today. Why don't they get somebody else to teach that class? I'm already teaching a class, but I've got to teach that class. Oh, I looked at the list this morning. It's my time to work in preschool again. I don't want to work in preschool. They ought to make those mamas work in preschool. Why am I working in preschool? Oh, no. I've had a busy weekend. Choir practices this afternoon, and the preacher's going to go long, and we won't get out of here to who knows what time. I don't want, why do I have to be a part of choir? I don't feel like singing in the choir today. And what happens is we sit there and we're like, well, I don't want to do this, or I don't want to do that. And why do I have to do this? And why do I have to do that? Has it ever occurred to you that it's not that you've got to, it's that you get to? I mean, some of God's most faithful people are the most absolutely miserable. And I see it all the time. And I'm not just picking on you, church. I mean, my, my goodness. I, I, I've been in churches and I've preached in churches to where I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I'm not the pastor of this church. And I'm the pastor of my church. I've been in some churches that are just deader than a hammer. You want to put your finger on them to make sure that they have a pulse. You want to scream, breathe. Come on, breathe. And the worship service, the worship service, just plain pitiful, just dead. Good folks going through the motions but not much celebration. And some of you are like, well, that's not how I celebrate and how I worship. Okay, okay. But don't you be that guy at your house. About 9.30 last night. Uh, don't be screaming where the neighbors hear you. Don't be sitting there going to that grandbaby's game and saying, look at him, he's mine, look at him, he's mine. Then you come in here, I hope God shows up. I'll tell you a story. And Emma, I'm going to use you, I'm sorry. This is my daughter. She doesn't like when I tell stories. She says I make a lot of them up. I just say that I, I fill in the blanks. That's what I, what I do. So she's younger. She was younger. I don't know. She might have been three or four. I don't know. Our girls are 17 months apart. And uh, this is when we lived. Uh, we lived in Greenfield, Jennifer. You remember we, we, we would go up to, uh, they had a little strip mall before they were kind of cool up in Union City. And we would go up there, Union City, Tennessee. And uh, Jennifer would go up there and she would buy shoes for them. And our, our oldest daughter who got married yesterday, uh, she has always been hard to buy shoes for. Um, and was always very opinionated about what she wanted and what she didn't want. And so we go to this little place, this little strip mall. We're there. And so Jennifer said, I'll take Abby and I'll go, I'll go get the shoes and stuff. And it wasn't a very big place. It had, it had an area out in the middle that we would call a food court, but there was no food. <laughs> I mean, they had vending machines and all that kind of stuff, but they had little rides for kids. 
And uh, I said, okay, I'll sit out here with Emma and we'll, we'll play some stuff. And that way I can see you and I'll know when you're done. And so we're sitting there and uh, they had this little horse over there that it wasn't like the carousel. It was like one little horse. You remember, it's an electronic horse, just the one horse with a saddle that you would get on and you would ride the horse. And I said, hey, hey, would you like to ride the horse? And she's like, sure, yeah, you know, what, 50 cents to ride the horse. I give her two quarters. And, 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 and it was about 50 feet away from me. And so I could see her. I could see Jennifer. And there were other people there, but I could see everyone. And so she goes over. She, she puts the money in. She gets up on the horse, and she begins to ride the horse. Three to four minutes pass by. She's still riding the horse. I'm thinking, man, that's pretty good. 50 cents. You can't get anything for 50 cents. Three to four minutes go by, she's still riding the horse. I'm seeing Jennifer, she comes out of one store, you know, she's going in another store, and three to four minutes go by, and Emma's still riding the horse. It's now been 10 minutes that she's been riding this horse. She gets off the horse, she comes back over to me, and I'm like, my goodness, that was, that was a great ride for 50 cents, wasn't it? And she handed me my two quarters back, and she said, the machine was broken. What do you mean the machine was broken? I saw you riding the horse. I saw you getting into the horse. And, and this is so perfect for her. Here's what she said. She said, well, there was a bunch of people around, and they saw me get on the horse, and I didn't want to be embarrassed by them thinking that the horse wasn't right, so I just faked it and rode it for 10 minutes. <laughs> hmm. Wonder how many Christians are doing that today. Wonder how many Christians are going through the motions so everybody will think that they're all right with God. I wonder how many even come to this exciting church today and we're absolutely miserable today because the journey has grown weary. And you know what happens when our celebration ceases? Look, look, look back in verse 24. And these Baptists complained against Moses. Isn't that the truth? You lose your song, nothing's right. I mean, you want to find fault, you lose your song, right? You lose your song, you want to criticize somebody, somebody's to blame. And as soon as you lose the joy and the celebration, nothing feels the same. Now, I'm thankful that the Bible tells us what we're supposed to do when this happens. It doesn't matter how old you are, okay? If you're a follower of Christ, you can all identify with this. The Bible tells us what are we supposed to do? How are we to respond when the journey gets long, when you find yourself down in the dumps? Again, I'm not saying, oh, you've jumped off into immorality. I'm not saying you've lost your salvation. Again, kind of what we said spiritually, we can all find ourselves in a situation where we're like, I just can't really swallow, man. The, the, the dust is just so thick, it's kind of hard. Verse 25 tells us, so he, Moses, cried out to the Lord, and the Lord showed him, mm. <laughs> do you see what that says? The Lord showed him a tree. And he cast it in the waters. And the waters were made sweet. You say, Pastor, what do you do when you lose your song? You're a pastor. Do you ever lose your song? Are you kidding me? November of this past year, you guys have been walking this journey with us. Jennifer was diagnosed with cancer. And it, it, it was a gut punch. We, I don't, I, don't know, I don't guess you get prepared for anything like that, right? And so in January, she had surgery to remove the cancer and then more tests to see if the cancer was, and we, you know, we're kind of still walking through that whole process. So the last year, I, I should be honest, it's just stunk. Can, can I be fully transparent today? Is it okay for me to show really who I am and you won't tell anybody? Would, would that be okay? <laughs> January, and she had her surgery and we were there over in Mayo and we, we were finally released to come home. And we came home, and Reed, Reed was playing basketball for mostly. And she said, you know, you ought to go to the game tonight. And I'm like, I'm not going to the game. I'm not leaving you here. 
And she said, you know, we've missed a lot of his games. I think you ought to go. The, the girls are here. I, I'll be fine. And so I went to the game, and I, you know, I, I, I love sports. But uh, I'm sitting there, and all of a sudden, I get a phone call from a good friend of mine, Dr. Tommy Green, executive director of the Florida Baptist Convention. He said, hey, man, uh, I, just, I just wanted to let you know, I just got a phone call from a representative of the Southern Baptist Convention that says that you and your church are under investigation because of how you've ministered to another minister. We're two days from the surgery. I'm like, hmm. See, some of you guys remember, I even shared it with the church about two years ago, a mentor of mine, a friend of mine, that came to me and said, hey, can you help me? Can you walk with me through a process? And I selected three different pastors that I love, that I respect, that pastor some of the greatest churches in the United States of America, and we started a process of restoration in this individual's life. And they wrote all kinds of stories about me. It's amazing how people who never talk to you know the true intent of your heart. And so that same day, I get a text from our local DOM, and he said, hey, man, just letting you know, I just, I just, got, a, I just got a contact from somebody uh, with the Southern Baptist Convention that says, you and your church are under investigation. I said, well, yeah, I just, I just kind of got, got that call from Tommy. One of our staff members, one of our assistants reached out to me and said, hey, pastor, I don't know what's going on, but I, I, I've got a, a request from a newspaper reporter at the Tennessean in Nashville wanting to interview you over the fact that you and our church are under inquiry or investigation. Now, no one had reached out to me. Been Southern Baptist my whole life, went to a Southern Baptist college, went to a Southern Baptist university, had devoted my entire life to a convention, and not one would reach out to me. No phone calls, checking on my wife, seeing how things were going. Here I am. Doing what I believe the Bible teaches, what do you do when a brother is down? You help them, you pray for them, you minister to them. Even people within our own congregation, some are still here, some left, that got online and they started reading stuff and they started clickbaiting and they started believing stuff instead of coming and talking to me. I'm just being wide open, okay? You told me you are going to be all right with it. And I'm sitting there in that gym. And I find out that the very folks that are people that are supposed to be supporting me and encouraging me during difficult times that I've devoted my life to are now using me and my ministry and the ministry of this church as a pawn in a political national scheme. And the very fact I don't even know what's going on and I already had a national reporter wanting an interview from me. My wife's at home. We don't know what's going on with the cancer. And I'm sitting in that little gym and I'm like, you know what, God? Forget it all. People that I would pastor, that I would walk with, that wouldn't have the decency to talk to me or even believe what I said. And I was dry. And I was thirsty. And I'm like, God, why would you let me walk through all this only to come here and all of it be torn and thrown away? I'm just being honest, guys. I was in a bad place. You say, Pastor, do you, do you ever lose your song? Are you kidding me? You say, what do you do? I do what I was taught 
by that mentor to do that I was ministering to. I go back to the tree. I go back to the cross. It's impossible to stay dry and depleted and dehydrated. It's impossible when your focus is on the cross. But I'd be lying to you to sit there and say, I've never found myself in this situation. It is absolutely true that I've found myself in this situation. Matter of fact, get ready, guys. There'll be folks who grab this sermon online, and it'll be all across the Baptist world, and they'll be coming at me again. Can I just say, that's okay. Go ahead. We're putting it up. I'll focus on Jesus. I don't have to be Southern Baptist. I don't have to be on any committees. I don't have to have anybody making anything about my name. I'll focus on Jesus. And some of you are like, what have we gotten into? I, didn't, I, I just came for church today. What, what is Southern Baptist? Good. It's so good. It's so good that you don't even know. I'm just, being, I'm just being open, guys. I'm a little weepy. I gave my daughter away yesterday. Goodness. You got a song, Stop Complaining. It's what God said to me. I've not changed. That's what he said to me. And I began to celebrate Jesus again. Your celebration ceases. You need a drink. Here's the second one. We got to hurry. Well, actually, we got plenty of time. <laughs> when your strength is spent, you better get yourself a drink. Samson, one of God's greatest men, Judges chapter 15. If you want to flip over there, it'll be on the screens if you don't want to. Judges chapter 15, verses 14 and 15. Listen to what it says. It says, when Samson, right, that strong man of old, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting against him. And then the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. And the ropes that were on his arms became like flax that is burned with fire. And his bonds broke loose from his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Now, can I just stop and say, every time I read that text, I'm like, I mean, who in the right mind? They're just walking there like, oh, look, there's a fresh jawbone of a donkey. Like, just right there on the side of the road. I, I just find humor in that. And he reached out in hand, his hand and he took it. And he killed a thousand men with it. And that's a pretty good day's work, isn't it? Man of God's walking down the road. He's suddenly surrounded by a thousand men. They weren't there to congratulate him. They weren't there to encourage him. They were there to kill him. And the Bible says that he picks up this old sun-bleached jawbone of a donkey and he kills a thousand men. But I want you to see what happens next because we don't preach this part. Verse 18. Then he became very thirsty. You want to know who I'm preaching to now? I'm not preaching to the vilest sinner. I'm not preaching now to the backslidden. I'm preaching to the warrior, right? I'm preaching to the faithful. I'm preaching to someone. A wall is not even in your vocabulary. You've never left it. I'm preaching to the soldier that's out there on the front line who's giving everything he's got for the Lord. The one who gives all their strength to serve the Lord. Here's the man of God. He just killed 10,000 men. And then he becomes very th thirsty. I looked at that word thirsty in the original Hebrew because I wanted to see what it said there. It means more than just wanting a drink of water. The reality is you and I really don't know what it means to be thirsty. The word for thirst there is so powerful, it means that he was completely depleted. It means that he was mentally and he was emotionally and he was physically and he was spiritually exhausted. Here's what we'd say. He spent Oh, he won the battle. He wasn't defeated. He was depleted. Wasn't beaten, but he was whipped. You ever been there? I'm preaching to someone right now. You're standing in the gap for your family, man. You've poured out your life. You've poured out your prayer life for your family, and you've won. You've come, on, you've come out on the other side victorious. You better get yourself a drink. Because if you don't, you're going to lose the victory. I'm talking to someone here this morning that you've withstood great temptation. The devil has thrown everything at you that he has. And you fought the battle and you won. 
Now, you better go get you a drink from that well in heaven. Or you're going to lose the victory. Several years ago, you'll find this hard to believe. Uh, I put on a few pounds. And I'm like, I need to lose some weight. And uh, so I decided I would take up jogging. Went and bought myself a new pair of running shoes and, uh, and started jogging. I'd been jogging two days, and here's what I thought. This is the most boring sport there is. <laughs> started at the same place, into the same place. Same dogs at the same location chase you every day. I'm like, this is terrible. I can't keep doing this. I got to have motivation. I got to have a goal. So someone told me that that Saturday they were going to have a three-mile race. I mean, you call it a 5K, but it's 3.1 miles. And I thought, that's what I need. So I signed up for the race. I started running on Monday. I'd ran for three days and signed up for a race that Saturday. So I thought, well, how do I get ready? I know how I need to get ready. I need to go out and buy me a new outfit that'll match my new running shoes. And so I did. I went out and got a new outfit and new hat and had those new shoes. And I showed up that morning, early in the morning, to get ready for the race. And there was a guy that was walking around and comes to find out he was the marshal. And he's, he's getting all this stuff, gave me a number that I, I put on the front of my shirt. And then he asked this question. He said, how many of you are rookie runners? Raise your hand, rookie runner. I raised my hand. There's a excuse me, a few other folks that raised their hand. He said, all right, all you rookie runners. It was July, okay? It was July. He said, it's hot and it's going to get hotter. You better hydrate. Have you hydrated? You better hydrate. You're going to lose a lot of sweat. It's going to be hard. You need to hydrate. And here's what I'm thinking. Hydrate? I hydrated when I left the house. I'll hydrate when I get back home today. I mean, I played ball in high school. I'm an athlete. I don't need to hydrate. And about that time, the gun was shot, and the race begins. They let all the senior adults go first. And so I see them all in front of me, many of which went to my church. And that male ego kicked in. And I thought, you know what? I'm not going to win the thing, but I'm not going to finish last. And so I decided right out of the chute that I would sprint. So I took off running as fast as I could. I passed all those senior adults. Get to mile marker number one, and here's what I'm thinking. That was a dumb thing to do. You should not have sprinted. You're going to die. You are literally going to die. And so, you know, I knew some of my teenagers from the church that were there. They were waiting on me at the finish line. And so I'm like, man, I got, you know, I tell them all the time, stick with stuff. So I got I to gotta do this. So, so I take off running again from mile marker number one. I get to mile marker number two, and I'm literally hanging on for two. And then all of a sudden, the sun's made me crazy. I'm thinking all these crazy thoughts, and I'm looking at those shoes, and I'm like, I hate you shoes. I can't, you know, you're not even worthy of a garage sale. And, and you know, and, and all of a sudden, I start talking to them. I get you home, I'm going to burn you, and, and just all this kind of stuff. And I'm like, I, I got I to go. And so I, I take off from mile marker number two. I get two and a half miles in. And a little old 70-year-old lady from the church goes by me and says, you're doing a good job, son. Just keep it up. (laughs) She didn't have uh, any sweat at all. I've already sweat through my clothes. (laughs) And I don't mean to be unkind to 70-year-old ladies this morning. Please hear me. But when she said that, you're doing a good job, keep it up, Sonny, I thought, "Uh uh-uh, not today, Granny. And so I (laughs) smoked it. As hard as I could, beat her by two yards at the finish line. (laughs) And I'm sitting there, and I'm looking around, and I'm holding my shorts like basketball players do. And I'm just looking around. I never knew why basketball players held their shorts like this. I know now. That's what you do right before you're going to die. And I'm sitting there, and I'm just, I'm I'm holding it, and I'm looking around. I'm like, where would be a good place to go lay down and meet Jesus at? And. The finish line was right up against the, uh, the, the river. 
And so I, so, so I went over to their table and I started getting that water and I started pouring some in me. I started pouring some on me and I got four or five bottles. I'm drinking Gatorade. I'm drinking anything I can. I get over there and lay up against the river. The breeze is coming off of the river. Kind of refreshed me. Started hydrating a little bit. And, 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 then, and then one of the guys from the church comes over there and he's sitting there and he goes, hey man, really proud of you. You did a really good job and all that kind of stuff. And you know, how was it? And everything. I said, you know what? Uh, I, I really, I, when I was doing it, I didn't know that I'd ever do it again. But you know what? I think I may go ahead and sign up for next year. In the middle of the journey, I never wanted to do it again. I didn't think it was worth it. I didn't think I had anything to gain. It was an endurance, not an enjoyment. Oh, but once I got a drink, once I refreshed myself, once that physical water began to quench my thirst, I realized it was worth the battle. I realized it was worth the effort. Friend, I don't know where you are on your Christian journey. You may be in the greatest battle of your Christian life. I'm just saying, you better get yourself a drink from the well that'll never run dry. Because if you don't get yourself a drink, you're going to find yourself doing exactly what Samson did. Look at what his faithful warrior did in verse 16. First of all comes the pride. Look at what he said in verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Then Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have slain a thousand men. This is one of the first instances that we ever see in history of trash talk. He's saying, Look at me. Look at what I've done. Isn't that what we do in the Christian life? Look at me. Look at what I've done. And then after the pride comes the pity. Look in verse 18. So he cried out to the Lord. And he said, you've given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant. And now shall I die of thirst? God, you just, you've just allowed me to kill a thousand men with a jawbone of a donkey. And now you're going to let me die from thirst. Do you know what I've found? These old earthly bodies can only... They can only handle so much glory. Isn't that true? That's the way that we're geared. And there are times that we need to drink. There are times that we need refreshment. Verse 19. Here's what verse 19 says. We'll finish this thing up. So God split the hollow place that is in Lehi. And water came out. And he drank. Notice this. And his spirit returned. And he was revived. Friend, I'm telling you today, based upon the authority of God's word, wherever you find yourself on this Christian pilgrimage, if you need a drink, he'll give you one. So back in January, and I was at that high school basketball game, the very world that I'd kind of built my life around was now caving in. And here I am, and I'm asking the question, what what did I do? What, what, What was wrong? By by the way, in case I didn't say this, just let me say this, guys. A good majority of what's happening in the Southern Baptist Convention right now on a national basis is politically motivated. I'm ashamed for folks to know that I've ever been affiliated with the Southern Baptist Convention. I called a deacons meeting. Went in the room and kind of shared with our guys what had happened. But now they were aware of what was going on because they had been walking it with me for a year and a half. All of a sudden, one of them spoke up and said, now, who's been saying this about you? One of them said, who's been questioning your integrity? The ministry of this church? Another one said, it's only an eight-hour drive to Nashville. (laughs) We go have a come to Jesus. I don't don't know what that means, come to Jesus. It doesn't sound good, though, does it? 
Another one spoke up and said, I got a bag of deer jerky in the truck. We can get it and we can go. And we got some rednecks for deacons, guys. Let's be honest with you. They, they, here's what, pastor. We're upset over the fact that you're having to deal with this now. When your focus should be on ministering to your family. And man, they're ready to go. They're ready to go. And then one of our older, wiser deacons spoke up and said, now hang on guys, there'll be plenty of time for that. What we need to do right now is, we need to gather around our pastor. And we need to hold his hands up. And we need to minister to him. And we need to pray. One by one. They started praying over their pastor. They prayed over their pastor. And they ministered to their pastor. And when it was done, I can remember thinking, Lord, all I asked was for you to give me a drink of water. And you just poured out Niagara Falls. Oh, I'm being wide open today. If you're looking for a church with a pastor that doesn't have difficulties and struggles and sometimes get thirsty, well, either this is not the church for you or y'all going to have to get a different pastor. But I can promise you, the very well that I drink from is available to all who will come. Let's get back and let's, let's finish this in the proper context, okay? The Feast of Tabernacles. Each day, the high priest would take some of the water and pour it out on the ground. Don't miss this. And then he would take the water and he would mix it with some wine. And then he would take that and he would, he would pour that out on the altar where they would make the daily sacrifices. If you would ask most rabbis, well, why, why the water and the wine? Here's what they would say. They would say the water represents the blessing of rain. And the wine represents the blessing of the vine or the, or the produce, right? Or the harvest. But that's not the real reason. You know the real reason. We'll get to John chapter 19, and in John chapter 19, we will read that when that Roman soldier took that spear and he punctured the side of Jesus, water and blood flowed out mixed together. This was a foreshadowing of the perfect lamb that even in their feast and festivals, And God's saying, oh, you're focusing on the rain. You're focusing on the water. You're focusing on the gift. Understand, I'm sending you one. And he's going to cover it all. He's going to satisfy. There's an old song that we used to sing, or I did growing up, Rock of Ages. You remember that? Rock of ages, cleft. Now, the word cleft there means divided. It means punctured. It means split. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Let the water and the blood. Here's what I'm thinking. If this preaching thing doesn't work out, I'm going to get with Calvin. We're going to come up with a country western album. I think it'll be great. (laughs) forgive my silliness let the water and the blood don't miss this from thy wounded side which flowed before sin the double cure a double cure you kidding me there was only one cure needed through Jesus but he's so good he's the double cure 
Before sin, the double cure. Save from death and make me sure. Do you need a drink today? Are you thirsty? Come to Jesus. Get a drink. He'll see you through. Father God, thank you today for the truth of your word. I thank you, Lord Jesus, that you know us exactly the way we are. I thank you, Jesus, you know where we're walking. That, Father, even though we may put on the best outward appearance, you know the real us. And, Jesus, we thank you that you love us no less. We thank you for the hope that we have in you. And we thank you that if we need a drink, we can come to your well. With our heads still bowed in a time of prayer, I just want to ask you a few questions, then we're going to move. I want to ask you this today. Do you know Jesus as your Lord? All three of these young people that we baptized a while ago, the question was asked, who's the Lord of your life? All three without hesitation, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ. Could you say that today? Oh, please hear me. I'm not asking you, do you know facts about him? Do you worship his birthday and celebrate his resurrection? I'm not asking you those things. Do you know him? Do you have a personal relationship with him? See, friend, if you focus on pointing back to a previous event as a determining factor of knowing Jesus, that may be a good indication that you don't know him. Do you walk with him? Is he ever working in your life every day? Is your desire to be made more like him? If not today, I want to invite you to come. Just a moment, we'll stand, we'll sing. We'll sing a song of praise and glory. I praise you, Lord. Oh, and there are going to be pastors all down front. Maybe today you'd just come and say, you know what, today, today I'm ready to turn to Jesus once and for all, surrendering my life to him. But yet I dare to believe that there are many, many, many others of you in this room, maybe even outside of this room, And while you would say that you know that you're saved, you know that when you take your last breath, heaven will be your home. The reality is you're spent, you're worn out, you're tired. Oh friend, maybe your prayer would be today, God open up the windows of heaven and rain down on this parched soul. God, fill me up and pour me out. Fill me up again. I'm just saying, even the best of us need to get a drink. So the altar will be open for prayer. If you'd like to come and pray, grab a friend. There'll be pastors here if you'd like to come and pray with them. Oh, God, continue to speak to our hearts that you would get glory through it all. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Would you stand your